Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 1. V10, Chapter 122 Future Lines. Written by P. W. O. Falcon. Roma Highway, Outpost Alpha 3. December 26 ST, 2025. Specialist in Richo Diaz walks up to the observation post that is on top of their sandbag bunker. In both of his hands is a cup of coffee. When he gets up there, he sees his buddy, Corporal Escobar Fernandez. Both are on guard duty at the Brazilian Army checkpoint. Both are on nighttime watch duty. Here you go Escobar, he said as he hands him the coffee. Thanks, buddy, Escobar said and takes a drink. Man, I don't remember them saying it will be this cold. It is only 11.6 degrees out here, Rodrigo responds. Yeah well. I am from a jungle country so screw you, Escobar responds and drinks his coffee. He sits down and takes a drink. I have to agree with my friend Italian, it is cold. I am sorry your sorry country is so cold. He then said with a chuckle. After the raid of Sadira, American rangers rescued a Brazilian student who was taken in Philadelphia when the gate appeared. When the student was returned, he was in bad shape. While the government has kept the details on his health, it was cleared that he was a sex slave for one of the imperial nobles, which seems to be the norm on Fallmart. With that and when the population found out that five American soldiers died in the raid, public opinion in joining in the war against the empire dramatically increased. The government was hesitated to take any action at first, Brazil not having a tradition of expedition wars. The last time a Brazil army found in a major war was World War II with the Cobras Fumantes or known as then Smoking Snakes. However, the government has been wanting to align closer to NATO and the United States. They knew it was only a matter of time they ended up joining but struggled to reform the military to meet the new needs. What happened to the student only empowered the pro-war faction of the population, pushing the country to declare war and join NATO expeditionary force. If I knew it was going to be this cold I wouldn't have signed up, he said as a joke. He sees his friend laugh at that. He turns around and looks at the Italian Corporal Rodrigo Gengo as he sits on the sandbags as he is on watch duty. Knock it off Brazilian. They have good hearing. Some of them have a great smell too. Escobar looks over to the Italian soldier. You sound like you scared of them. They have bows and arrows. Rodrigo looks directly at both. This is their country, their planet. We are the unwelcome guest forcing ourselves here. Arrows can still kill. Our armor cannot stop a sword or spear. If you are on patrol and get surrounded, someone will die. I was part of the opening stages of taking Ellie's. We were taking the north flank. While we easily pushed through their defense, we did lose too many when we had to fight in their trenches. My company lost three men and seven wounded clearing those trenches. Rodrigo explains as he thinks of his fallen. What Rodrigo said puts some fear into him. He thought with their overwhelming firepower and superior technology that this would be an easy war. But we are stronger. We might be technology stronger but that doesn't mean shit when a sword is coming at you. They have magic and monsters, demigods and more. Rodrigo explains and looks back out into the field and river. It will be wise for you not to underestimate them. Even a paper cut can make you bleed. Just last week a company up north lost two men on a patrol. While they cannot win a direct fight, that does not mean don't watch your back. If it were not for our technology, we would be getting our asses kicked. These are some determined bastards. All right man, he said. He did not expect to hear that. The news back on earth always said how NATO and their coalitional allies are defeating tens of thousands of the Empire soldiers in battle. But what do you think? This place looks like earth. Just fewer trees like in my home state of Brazil. Don't be silly man, Escobar interjects. We all know why we are here. A new world, new resources. The US is the global superpower and chooses who gets access to the gate. Of course, its NATO allies get access, that is the only reason why they triggered Article 5. If we want a role in any of this, we have to show we will play the game. We are here just to save face with the Americans. He glances down at his mug thinking on what Escobar said. 
It is usually true that powerful nations use their weight to get what they want. That has been normal since the dawn of man. But that statement does not feel right to this situation. There has been a public debate since 2020 about Brazil trying to join NATO. While nothing official has started, it has been an interesting topic. While Colombia has been very public in joining the military organization, NATO still stuck in the European club mindset. Brazil has started cracking that mindset, being a developing power in the world. I don't agree, he said and can see Escobar about lecture him. Hold on. Let me explain. I am assuming you saw the videos and streams from the attack? Of course. Aliens attacking. They are the most popular videos on the internet. Probably for the next hundred years. Escobar responds, slightly confused about the question. Well, remember watching that American woman reporter being attacked and raped? And then that cameraman being eaten alive? He asked, looking directly at him. He remembers that day, his eyes glued to the television in the family room. He was downstairs with his family, eyes glued to the television screen. He was watching this American woman in a nice red skirt suit, talking into a camera. Around here were police and SWAT, firing at something that was coming. This loud roar in the background could be heard over all the gunfire. He had no idea what was happening. It is not every day you watch the most powerful country on the planet get attacked, especially from within the country. His uncle thought it was communist uprising while his father thought it was another terrorist attack. He was being old enough to remember 9-11. The debate ended when they all saw that, creature. They saw trolls used a club and smash into the police line. Another police car flying into the ground, forcing the police barricade open. The next thing he saw goblins attacking the woman as she was reporting. To this day he still remembers her screaming for help with her desperate voice. The camera dropped to the ground and the cameraman rushed to try and to help her. These two other green men tackled him and started eating and cutting into his arm and body like they were from some zombie film. All he can remember is the screams in the background as people being slaughtered by these men on horse and horse people. That giant monster with a club picks up this police office, ripping him in half and then begins eating its inside like it was some treat. That cameraman yelling and screaming as he was eaten alive and having his meat be cut his body by those two things. That reporter woman was still live on the internet as she was being raped and stripped for the whole world to see. She is being attacked by those things over and over until the feed finally ended, being cut off by the company. He cannot remember how long he looked at the blank screen, but it felt like hours, but probably was more like minutes. He looks to his family and saw everyone was in shock. No one could move or say a word. Finally, his father picked up the remote and found a new stream. For the rest of the day, he just sat there watching as US troops started pouring into the city. The heart of the city in flames, smoke everywhere. He remembers watching these soldiers covering one of their tanks, as it aims its cannon towards this eight or nine story tall giant man before being killed by the tank blast. Soldiers all around firing into these strange human like people, but clearly not from Earth. Slowly, he started to recognize them from creatures from fantasy stories. The more what he saw made sense, the more his mind told him none of it made sense. Those green men reminded him of goblins, the blue beats of trolls. He sees elves mixed in and many other creatures that he cannot recognize. He saw a different group of SWAT and police as they try to protect civilians. This human woman standing there with this stick, forming this strange energy barrier, and then bursting it into the soldiers and police, knocking a lot of them over before being swarmed by hundreds of these swordsmen. It was strange, humans, but all these other monsters. Many of the buildings in flames, the glass shattered, and cars piled up smoking in flames. Bodies everywhere as US forces retook street by street. By the late afternoon, the US military started getting control of the situation and was pushing the aliens back to that. Gate. That is when he figured out that these aliens came from that opening. His whole world froze as he saw all that. He knew 7 billion people on Earth felt the same way. He knew the world would never be the same after this. Escobar takes a deep breath, not liking where this is going. Who hasn't? It is fucking depressing watching it. He looks up at Escobar. 
this doesn't feel like some feel-good war where the powerful country exploits a weaker one for some bullshit reason. It does not feel like it is those banana republic wars that I learned about in history. I remember watching it and I never felt more scared in my life. I saw the fear in my family's eyes. We were attacked. You say we were attacked, Escobar said. They were attacked. This isn't our war. We are not in NATO. I don't want to be hacked to death on some alien world. I disagree, we should be here. Come on man, he responds, leaning forward. That could have happened in Brazil. You cannot tell me you don't feel it. Something has changed. We are fighting space people. With bows and arrows, Escobar adds. And magic, whatever that means. That is my point, he responds. I don't see this just another American war. They did take one of our people. This is bigger than we know. I don't know man, Escobar said as he adjusts himself. I think you are overthinking all this. Be careful about that, overthinking gets people killed. He takes an annoyed breath. He remembers wishing he could go get into the fight when the gate first appeared. NATO triggered Article 5 four days later, and Japan quickly reformed its military to offer any assistance. He knew if the Japanese were willing to abandon eight years of peace, this was not a normal war. By the end of that month, most of the Western world began mobilization for humanity's first interstellar war through that gate. I think you are underthinking it, he said. Escobar listens. I am not saying this is some grand war for survival, but it is a war between two worlds. Our world was attacked, and we have a choice. Do we stand alone or united against this? Escobar looks at him. They have bows and arrows. And what about the next alien? He shoots back. Will they have bows and arrows? He can see that question took him off guard. He looks to his sergeant. Rodrigo, what do you think? I don't get paid to think specialist, Rodrigo said. Escobar right, we come here and do our duty for mankind and go home alive. But Rodrigo looks to him. But I must admit, you make a good point. The platoon I am in has been debating something similar. In my country, the war is immensely popular, 83%. You cannot 30% popularly in anything in Europe anymore. Only one person voted against the war in Parliament and he got voted out. Rodrigo takes a deep breath and glances away. This isn't a war for some damn pipeline between two countries or for some activist utopian reasons. Hell, it is not even a war because I am pissed about what your people did to an ancestor a thousand years ago did. This is a new one. Asking people for a new war would be an automatic kicked out of office thing but no. There is a huge amount of pride in going to war this time. We were attacked. Italian or American, didn't seem to matter as much as you might think. Rodrigo states with a lot of energy. Let me explain something to both of you, Rodrigo begins to say, but then four flares from, the trip wires explode into the air. Battle station. He yells as he grabs his Beretta ARX-160 and begins firing. The emergency lights that face the east appear on and begin pointing to the direction of the fire. Get on the point five zero caliber. Escobar yells as he rushes to the sandbag wall and starts firing his Imbol IA-2. He gets up and rushes over to the tripod M2 Browning 50. Caliber machine gun. He starts firing it as a few arrows start raining down on the outpost. He looks out and sees all these figures rushing up into the perimeter. How they get through the barbed wire. He yells as he aims at the largest group. I told you, they have magic, Rodrigo yells. He looks over and sees other soldiers getting out of the sandbag buildings and rushing to the defense. He sees that he kills three enemy soldiers, being torn a shred by the massive .50 bullet. He smiles as he sees they are ponding the attacking infantry. He looks to the left and sees Sergeant Julio Pino and Captain Julio Avila Fatodo climb up the ladder and rush to their position. What is going on? How did they get so close? Captain Julio Avila Fatodo asked. Rodrigo turns around to face the captain. Sir, they get a little closer each raid. Futrado looks up past the sandbags and analyze the situation. Really? 
they must have a tunnel then. Negative sir, Rodrigo corrects. We already thought of that. Drones haven't picked up anything. Look, Corporal, I am telling you there has to be a tunnel. We ran into them all the time in the Amazon against cartels and separatists. Our scanners didn't always pick them up. Futrado explains. He looks to his captain. Sir, tree line. Looks like this is a distraction. Futrado looks out and sees a large enemy force advancing. How do they plan on crossing the river? Pinheiro asked. They are crazy. Doesn't matter right now, Futrado said. Get on the horn and fry them. He looks back out and fires his M2 again. This is the first time he has seen combat outside of training. Bullets and tracers from dozens of soldiers firing out. Flares going out to light up the engagement area. Captain Futrado, Pinheiro yells. American artillery inbound. Incoming. As he fires his weapon, he can hear the loud zooms in the sky. Moments later a dozen fragmentation explosions appear all along the riverbed, killing many of them. Then another artillery wave comes in and does the same thing. It would not take long before the last remaining enemy force retreats. Holy shit, we pushed them back. That was only a small raid, Rodrigo said as he stands up. They want us to follow so they can pick us off. I have seen it happen to my platoon. Two wounded. I read the report corporal, Futrado said as he stands up. We stay here tonight and tomorrow we mop up. Fort Alnus. December 26 ST, 2025. Rory stands there with her halberd out, ready to slay her opponent. She tightens her grin and controls her breathing. She has joined these people and sworn an oath to Emroy to protect and guide these people. While they are smart and mean well, they are like children who never seen the world, literally. They need someone to safely guide them, so they do not fall victim to what happens with all great power. And she will defend them wherever possible, like now. She thinks smirks and licks her lips. Let's party baby doll. She then burst forward, bring her weapon back. I am not going to let you take Alnus. She gets to her opponent and swings her halberd down. The enemy barely was able to dodge her attack, moving to the left. She lifts her weapon and then swings it around. She almost was able to separate the head off her opponent's body. Interesting, you are fast. While her weapon is out of position, her opponent gets in close and tackles her. She smirks as she grabs her opponent tackles her, trying to pin her down. How cute. She grabs her opponent, trips her leg, and swing her over, slams her opponent to the ground. She then swings her halberd with one hand and brings the blade to the neck of her opponent. Now die. She said in a sadistic tone. Okay. Uncle, uncle. Alicia yells while in pain. Time. Sharp yells as he presses stop on a stopwatch. You are improving Alicia. One day you might be able to keep up with Rory. She looks over to Sharp and smirks, refusing to move her weapon away. Why? This is a battle to the death. And no one will ever be able to keep up with me. I am one of a kind. Wait, no it's not. Alicia said as her eyes widen. She put her foot on top of Alicia to prevent her from crawling away. In the right of conquest, I have the right to do with her as I please. I choose death. She states with an evil tone. Alicia looks up at her. I thought we were warrior sisters. Shut up. She pushes her foot down harder. She then looks to Sharp as he rubs his head, trying to figure out what to do. She loves to make his life harder. Cannot let her man get lazy after all. Sharp points to her. Rory, you won 20 out of one time today against Alicia. Enough training for today. She frowns at that one part. She holds up her figure and she glare at him. During the fifth round, Alicia pulled a fast one on her. Alicia said that her skirt was up for everyone to see. In her distraction to make sure she was decent, the next thing she knew she was on the ground. She knows that Sharp had a hand into that because he walked up to Alicia and said something to her before the match. That one doesn't count. 
that was not fair. She speaks. In Love and War Rory, it counts, Sharp said with a smirk. She just stomped on Alicia harder after hearing that. Ah. I disagree, it doesn't count. It just doesn't count, please Major make her stop. Alicia said as she begs for her life. I keep telling you Rory, you shouldn't wear a skirt into battle, Sharp said. Now get off her. He said in his command tone. She takes a deep breath and then smiles. She lifts her halberd and swings it back to her shoulder. Fine. She gets off Alicia and then gives him a flirtish glare. You. Might say that though, but I have caught you many times taking a glance up my skirt. She then gives him a sexy wink. Sharp crosses his arms. You are the one who's offering. It would be rude not to look at the menu. He winks back and starts walking away. She glares at him after hearing that but turns red. Somehow, he never gets embarrassed by her flirtation but turns it around right back at her. She loves those games, trying to up one him. Then she smiles with them though and looks to Alicia. Alicia shakes her head. You two make me sick. I am hitting the showers and then into town. She smiles and waves at her. By warrior sister. Congratulations on your recent promotion. She found out today that Alicia was promoted to specialist. After Battle of Legrath and the recent battle at Havkriston most of the rangers. Andrew was promoted to sergeant, Scott promoted to private first class while Alicia promoted to specialist. Yeah, yeah, Alicia said as she walks away, holding her back. Never knew promotions hurt. She then rushes up to Sharp and pats him on the back. That was fun Jackson. You and I should go toe-to-toe -to -toe next time. Alone, in private, away from people. Sharp looks down at her. Maybe. I think I know a few ways of taking you out. She was about to respond to that and then goes quiet, afraid of the meaning behind it. She then looks over to the constructing buildings. So, what is happening here? I will show you, heading to the office that's under construction, Sharp said. When we first came here Fort Alnus, it was designed in a defensive manner. We grew past its capacity and besides, it doesn't fit our needs. Now that we settled down and know more about this world, we no longer fear a second attack. He then points to some buildings. Those will be barracks for the knights. Those three over there are for the other vanguard teams. That one over there is for the Alnus militia. Over there is the lounging area for all the enlisted. A pleas for the troops to relax. It will be a hybrid of both worlds. So, the knights and militia feel more at home. She looks up at him. Alnus militia? So that's finally happening? He stops and looks down at her. Yep. Alnus command wants us to get back on exploring. Pushing on the final frontier. And, to train our new allies with our equipment and tactics. Where will we be? She asked as she looks around. From what I understand, I will be there. That is my command office as I take command of Vanguard 2, 5 and 7, on top of the knights and militia. And training them. Fun. He said with a chuckle. But you girls will be with me. Each of you will have your own room now, all of us connected to a living room and kitchen. It is the army's way of saying thank you. And you keeping an eye on us. She said with a big smile. It will be easier to assault you. He looks down at her. Taller people have tried Rory and failed. I am not short. She yells after hearing that. She hates that she is shorter than everyone. She feels like the only reason people listen to her is that she is an apostle. If it were not that no one ever would because of her height. Sharp chuckle from that. I told Colonel Robert that it was a pain to get everyone together. You girls were in the town, the night now was across the base and I was separated from everyone. We needed to centralize it. That is the only way we can make this work. Both worlds working together. That is nice, but what do I call it? Or is it still called Alna since we're still technically on the hill? She asked. No, Sharp responds. Since the 8th Division is being partly being reactivated, 
Colonel Robert recommended naming it after Staff Sergeant John W. Minnick. So, this place is being named Fort Minnick. Who is he? She asked as she scratches her head. He stops and looks at her. He was one of three who won the Medal of Honor within the division during World War II. The battalion he was in was stopped by a minefield. You know, those explosives we put into the ground around the base. Anyway, during that, he led his team through the minefield and obstacles and took out a machine gun post that was attacking his unit. By himself, he killed 20 men and captured 20 more. He then started scouting through a second minefield but accidentally detonated it. But he saved dozens if not hundreds of his fellow soldiers. She blinks as she thinks about that. That battle sounds very intense and helps show her that she still does not fully understand how war is fought on his world. She knows there are gods in his world who refuse to interact with their worshippers and she finds that silly. But hearing that she starts to understand why Aphrodite told her why they keep to themselves. If they interact then there would be no brave men like that willing to go above and beyond. Everything they do in their world is their choice, not some higher power. Sharp crosses his arms as he looks at a building being built. The colonel wanted the name of this camp to represent something, being an example to the new people. Technology is not what is winning this war. It helps, but people like Minnick are the reason why we will win. If we all go that extra mile, there is nothing that can stop us. That is what he said. And do you agree? She asked. She already knows his answer but wants him to say it, so he is clear. Of course, Sharp states. Sadira could have been a disaster. It was close but we pulled above the situation. Overcame Talin and Chrysis, took the fortress, beaten a flame dragon. Even the enemy is starting to join our side. You need examples in life Rory. Examples so you know it can be done. She looks at him with a big smile. While he does not talk about it much, he has been trying hard to get people from both worlds to work together. There have been many bumps on that road, but she is proud that he finally got there. He deserves to be in command of what he built. While she enjoyed what he said, everyone here sees him as that example, even if he does not see it like that. That is the number one reason she wants to be by his side. I am happy for you. Since those refugees from when we first met, you've been building all this. Finally, all that work is turning into something. She speaks. Yeah, I am not fully in command but that doesn't matter, Sharp said with an annoyed breath. He then looks at her. I was in a meeting last night. Your name came up many times. She looks at him confused. She points to herself. Me? Why would they be talking about me? You got an interesting fan club, he responds. Everyone is very thankful for all your help. You have gotten us out of trouble many times. She fake cough twice as she glances at him. While he is correct that she has helped his people exploring and fighting in this world, she mainly bailed him out when he got into a fight bigger than he can handle. She looks at him and can see from his expression that he knows what she is implying. Well, I could say that you bailed me out many times, but, then I won't give you your present. He said and walks away, starting to hum this song, being very cocky. As she watches him walk away, her eyes widen. But. Me want present. I want the present. Get back here. She then rushes at him and tries to tackle him. He stops everything and looks at her. He pulls out this small box and hands it to her. She quickly grabs the box and opens it. She sees these two silver color bars that are connected. She looks up confused by it. What is going on? She watches him as he gets onto his knee and places his hand on her shoulder. She has always found that cute about him. He always tells people he never will bend the knee, being all patriotic and that no free man would do, but he does it all the time. She glances at his hand, enjoying the hand on her shoulder. She notices that he does that all the time when he is communicating with people. Sometimes she wonders if he even knows he does it is, but the effect is strong. She has always assumed it is his way of showing that person all his attention is on him or her. She looks back at him. You don't have to, it is your choice, Sharp said. 
just spit it out, Rory said in a cute voice. If you choose to accept, you will oversee the Alnus militia. In an honorary position within the army, you will be the captain of them. He explains. Big responsibility, but I think you can handle it. She back at him and then down at the rank pin. Then she looks back at him. Does this mean I have to leave your team? Of course not, Sharp said. You are part of my team and always will be. She looks down at the rank. He has been truly kind to her and the other girls. First, he pushed on his people to get her legal residence, which means she has legal protections within their laws. While she prefers not to get too close to a country affair, not wanting her apostle title to get in the way, mainly because of her experience with the empire. Then he gave her a V7 badge, showing that she is an honorary member of the team. She has spent so long traveling and supporting herself, never staying in one place. Then came the home in Philadelphia, and that was an eye-opener. She has never been in one's place this long for as long as she can remember, and that is a long time for an apostle. Now, this? In the beginning, she just saw this as a temporary thing, helping along but. Never seeing it as more than that. Now she has a command within their organization. She then backs up at him. Captain, does that mean? I am still your boss, he said, making sure she knows he is in charge. She stretches her arms with a big smile, pushing out her chest a little. Only when I allow it. She then hugs him and kisses him on his cheek. Thank you. Ah, you're welcome. He said, baffled on what just happened. She takes a step back and sees his reaction. What a dork. Hungry? Sharp stands up. Why not? Let me text the girls. We can meet up at Apex. Liberty Apex. December 26 ST, 2025. Sarah is sitting there at her booth, drinking a glass of wine. With her are her friends Lieutenant April, Corporal Mayute, Princess Pina, Delilah, and her little friend Selina. Should I be drinking this? Selina asked as she holds a small glass of wine. It is okay, April said. Just a little should be fine. Girl secret. Selina looks to the red drink. But will dad like that? She smiles hearing her say, Dad. She then looks over to the other woman in the group. Everyone goes, oh, when they hear that. That is adorable Selina. She states. Stop it, Selina said annoyed by that. It is okay little one, we are just enjoying ourselves. It is just cute how you started calling him Dad besides Father. Mayute said and the takes a drink from the red wine. This tastes wonderful. You never had wine before? Pina asked as she sits back. This is one of my favorite drinks from Elba Grape Farms. Wine is wine, April said as she drinks. She sits back and sits closer to Selena. She asked a few of the ladies out for a small dinner. While Mayute and Delilah have no issues with each other, Pina is the old one out, being one of the leaders of the empire. She thought she could help legitimize her by bringing her along and meeting her friends. I never could afford that stuff, Mayute said, and see analyze the drink. I always saw this for your rich folk. She checklists hearing that and glances over to Pina and Delilah. While both seem to be having a good time, it looks like they are barely registering each other. She understands why, the Empire brutalized Delilah people and while she did not do it herself, she didn't stop it either. Tyul was offered to come but refused. So Mayute, how work? Still like being the law? She asked. Mayute takes a breath. I enjoy the work. My MP partner is good and all. I wish he shows a bit more emotion though besides being negative in life. It is not really his fault, she said. It is a common thing from people who lived under communism. It sucks the life out of a society. I still don't understand all that, Delilah said. You people talk about fighting ideas over people? It is complicated, April answers. That is what you people always say, Pina points out. Selina looks up. She has a point. Everything always complicated with you people. She looks down at Selina. Who teams are you on? She looks back at them all. 
I mean it is hard. Fighting for territory isn't a thing anymore. There's still some cases like Russia taking Crimea for a seaport and China trying to take the South Pacific and Central Asia for resources. But wars today are mainly fought for control of supply chains or ideological reasons. It is best to ask Sharp on it. He is really interested in that type of stuff. Be warned, he will talk forever if you ask, Selena said. I probably won't. I honestly don't care about the politics of your world. I am sorry if this offends you. Mayute said. Both Sarah and April laughs at that. April leans forward and holds up her glass. Welcome to the club. 99% of my world doesn't care about our politics either. Mayute giggles and glances away. But I have to say, I didn't expect it to get hard. Another child was taken last week. Another? Delilah asked, halfway shocked. What do you mean another? Pina asked. As Mayute explains, she looks over to Selena and places her hand on her shoulder. Hey dear, maybe it will be good if you go get us refills. Selena looks up as she holds her nearly empty glass. I am not afraid of the topic. I know what's been going on. And besides, I have a pistol. Anyone who tries to take me again I put on in the head and two in the chest. Then father will come and finish off the rest. Hearing all that she just stars at Selena. She said it so calmly like it is normal. Almost everything she said she can tell she got it from Sharp. She sees she is going to have to try and get Sharp to tone down what he said. I know Selena. Still, can you get all our refills? You can get yourself another glass too. Selena looks to her glass and back up. She smiles, enjoying the drink and wants more. She gets up and leaves. As Selena leaves, she looks back into the conversation. Mayute holds her hand halfway up as she explains. Basically, a kid disappears once every month. But there are no clues, tracks, nothing. They just vanish. We have been struggling to find anything. My lord, how many so far? Pina asked. I am not allowed to say. My ute. That many? April said. Yeah, my ute said. But let's not talk about work. It is a sensitive investigation. She looks over to Pina and sees she is wearing this red rob all like a dress. She has not seen her wear something like that since that failed peace attempt in Sad Era. Everyone there wore something like that. However, though, she does not see the style that much outside the capital. Because the countess and other nobles in Italica, everyone else wore a more basic type of clothes. Is everything okay Sarah? Pina asked as she sets down her wine. Just looking at you Rob, or is it called a dress? She asked. I do not see it much outside the higher society places like Sadira. Ah yeah, Pina said. We always wore something like this. Since the founding of Sadira thousands of years ago. It is more of a noble thing. Yes, because noblemen always do the noble thing to do, Delilah shoots and takes a drink. Pina takes a glare at Delilah from the statement she said. So why don't you call it the Sadira Empire? April asked, trying to discharge the situation. You have any idea how hard it is writing reports? Pina looks at her. You are right, I have no idea. Sadira means the city. The empire is all. It is not mine, Delilah states with a cold tone. She then drinks most of her wine. Pina glances over to her and back in April and her. Anyway, I remember this conversation before. It is what it is. The empire was always called the empire. She then finishes her drink. I just find it interesting how many different types of stay in clothing. Some wear pants while others wear robes like you. I have seen clothes from all different eras from my world. She speaks. Pina then smirks. To change the subject and now the little one is gone. Sarah, tell us what is going on between you and Major Sharp. When she heard Pina say that her face gets all red. Her body closes and she feels like she is sinking into her seat. She sees all of them looking directly at her. What scares her the most is that none of them seem shocked by the news but more like they already know. 
Nothing. She sees Pina, Delilah, and Mayute lean in closer, all looking directly at her. All at once they say that they do not believe her. They all united just to hear this gossip. Really, nothing has happened. She struggles to say as she tries to defuse the situation. Right then it hit her, they all seem way too interested in the topic. She wonders if the only reason they came here was to ask this? And they waited for Selena to leave? She moves to the side and holds up her hand. Selena. She then feels April grab her jacket and pulls her back. Sorry, you did this to yourself, first lieutenant. I have been listening to your mumbling about him for a year now. Time to face the gossip. April said in a cold tone. Oh God, she wonders. They all were waiting for Selena to leave and she was the one who did it. She looks at them all scared on that they are going to ask. Delilah looks forward, eyeing her up with one eye. I sense it all the way back to Ellie's when we picked up Tuka. His tone went from his normal commanding tone to a happier sweet tone. How? She asked, confused by that. I heard it in your tone, Delilah said as she sits back. You humans are easy to read. You're always projecting your emotions and smells all over the time. We warrior bunnies have to learn to tune your people out. Really? I think I only learned from hearsay. Mayute said. Hearsay? Hear from who? She asked, feeling very insecure. Mayute points to April. She has been telling me. Not my fault, April said. You have been talking and writing about him since we came to this world. She then holds her hands together and pretends to talk like Sarah. Oh, he is so handsome. Look how strong he is and love and caring under all that. She pushes in April. Hey, I don't sound or speak like that. I believe it, Delilah said with an evil grin and chuckle. Pina leans forward. There is no denying this. I don't know if she told you, but I saw them holding hands during movie night. She didn't mention that, April said in an evil tone. Yep, Pina said. And both of them pillow talking during the movie. She glares at Pina after hearing that. Out of all the cultural differences between both worlds, that has to be the universal one. Don't forget what happened in Havkristen, Delilah said. I was there, Pina said. He came to be with this desperation look in his eyes. He wanted to get her back so badly. Didn't he save you too? She shots back, trying to change the subject. Hold on, no changing the subject, Delilah states. Yeah, he saved me from a prison cell with those other bandits, Mayute adds. That doesn't mean anything compared to what happened with you. She takes a heavy breath as she listens to them all recapping what happened at Havkristen. That Sharp personally requested her help and how she was taken. How upset he got and how Pina took him to crisis. That both got into another, them all hyping up the part that two powerful and determined men fighting over her. And last him carrying her back to their lines. She cannot help but blush from remembering all that. It was an interesting and confusing experience. She had no idea that so many people cared that she was taken when that happened. And she had no idea how far he was willing to go for her. As she listens as the conversation devolves, she takes another deep breath and looks at them all. I love him. There, I said it. She sees all of them looking at her. First I hated him but then I felt pity for him. Not happy about that but that's true. Then when I learned who he really was I respected him. Then when he brought back those refugees and the girls. He has been a good father role figure to them and showed that he cares about people under that hard shell. I learned his wasn't just some normal soldier but, as he would say. She rolls her eyes, not believing what she is about to say. That's there's more than meets the eye with him. She looks up at them all and seeing them all giggling. April just rolls her eyes because she heard all this a million times and lived it with her. I still say he isn't good enough for you, but you never listened to me, April said. Why do you say that April? Mayute asked. Well, people like him don't normally make good husbands, April said. Look how hard it has been to fix him. She adds, using her fingers to quote, fix. 
and let's not forget he is suffering from PTSD. I just don't want Sarah to get hurt. What is PTSD? Pina asked, sounding concerned. It is a mental sickness, April said. It happens when a soldier goes through a traumatic situation. There are different levels. That is why Sarah here been pushing sharp to spend time with the girls. Oh, Pina said and thinks about it. We always thought that was cowardness. Hearing that she gets defensive. No. That isn't cowardness. Everyone has a limit and there was no one there for him when his career fell apart. Okay, but all I care about is does he care about you? You don't want to chase someone if they don't love you back. Mayut said. Pina looks over to her. I think he lives here. I have seen it before within night school. I hate to agree with the imperialist here, but she is right. There is some very subtle I can see when he walks around. And don't forget the dress, April adds. She pulls out her phone and shows them all over the picture. This is why she was asking you, Pina. You know about that? She asked, shocked. Yes, and that you two kissed twice back on earth, April said. She facepalms herself after hearing that. Yes, we did. It was pretty romantic. Mayut moves closer and looks at her directly into her eye. Who kissed who? Well, my father kissed him under the missile toe. Her eyes widen as she hears Selena's voice. She looks over and sees her standing there in her cute dress with a tray with full wine glasses. Hi, Selena. She said in a defeated tone. What is a missile toe? Mayut asked. It is called mistletoe and Selena, tell us what it means. April asked, knowing that Sarah is the one who told her it. Selena looks at them all with a big smile. It is a flower you have on the ceiling. When a man and woman walk under it, the man has to give the woman a kiss. That is what Sarah said. She had her eyes closed as she listens to that. She can feel them all looking at her. Damn it, Selena. She thinks to herself. Why are you all talking about my father? Selena asked, completely lost on what has been going on. She opens her eyes and interjects before anyone could speak. We were just saying how great of a father he is and how adorable you two are together. That's not even close. April tries to say before Sarah covers her mouth with her hand. Behind Selena, she sees the door open. Rory walks in and right behind her is sharp. Thank oh merciful God, she thinks to herself. Mayut stands up and waves. Hi Rory, hi Major. You two want to come over here. She frowns hearing that. Then she notices Sharp coming over here and knows all of them will tell them what has been said. Why God, why are you punishing me, she thinks to herself. She looks up at Selena. Selena dear, go say hi to your father. Selena has a big smile and puts the tray halfway on the table. She then dashes away. But the tray starts tipping forcing all of them to reach and leave the tray and drinks. After saving the drinks, they all of them look at each other and laugh. Delilah picks up her wine glass. It is interesting the bond those two have. I never have seen anything like it in an adopted relationship. Or normal relationship, Pina said. My father only addressed me when he needed me. At least, you knew who your father is, Delilah said. You don't know who your father is? She asked, shocked by that. It is normal, Delilah said. I feel nothing, but bunnies rarely know who their father is. They're only about 10% male and they rarely stick around. We normally breed with other races as we learned that they are always female and a bunny. So, there is no risk of a mixed race. If you ever say that on earth, you will piss off the internet, she said with a chuckle, understanding the context. It is lovely, but I find them a little to close, April said. You know they sleep together in the same bed a lot. That is not normal in our world. Many might think he could be a predator. Hearing enough, she places her hand on April's arm and then glares at her. That is enough. While she was willing to be picked on, she crosses the line here. She does not want stupid rumors popping up and making people think about it. 
she knows he is respected by the troops and after everything she has seen, she wants to keep it like that. But it only takes one bad apple to ruin everything. If he finds out if people are thinking like that about him, it could degrade their strong father-daughter bond. At one point she thought it might be wise to tell him to stop it, but she has seen him smile more, more open to people and approachable. He suffers from a mild level of PTSD and the girls have been great therapy for him. Look, I don't care if it is unusual by our standards. She said as her tone lays down the law. Nothing has been normal for either of them. No one is thinking what you said and if anyone wants to start then I will personally take care of it. The last thing both need to deal with is people questioning his character like that. He is a war hero that puts us his life on the line every day. He has been through a lot already. Going head to head against the worse who has a target on his head. She takes a quick breath and collects herself. She has learned firsthand how far he will go for the ones he loves. He also told her that he only can do that is because he believes that everyone has his back. He thinks we all have his back and that's why he can do what he does. It doesn't matter if it's just a cute joke, what those two have is special and I won't allow it to be ruined because of drams. She takes her glass and drinks it. She puts it down and looks at them all. While Rory keeps Sharp safe on the battlefield, Sarah decided that she will protect him here at home. She sees their reaction. All but Delilah seems shocked like they did not expect her to do that. Wow, here comes Mama Hen. Mayute states. Delilah holds up her glass. Saw that coming a full three leagues under the hill. I was starting to think you had no spine. Was about to say you weren't good enough for him. No, April said. You have to dig a little, but you don't mess with her. She drinks all her wine. Here he comes. She looks over and sees Selina pulling on his military jacket to them with Rory walking by his side. Mayut gets up and starts to talk to Rory. Hi ladies, hope I'm not bothering. Selina didn't give me much choice. Sharp said and then pays Selina in the shoulder. You're not, Delilah replied. We all were about to leave anyway. I got private plans with Bailey tonight once he's off duty. She and all the other women giggles at that. Speaking about Bailey, I need to finish his mission report for tomorrow. By the way Major, congratulations on your new post. April said. Now you are my boss. She leans back and watches. There were some changes to the Vanguard program because of the alien recruits. The main reason for the changes is that Alna's command wants the rangers to go back to exploring this world. Major Sharp was given a major command in the restructuring. While still directly in command of Vanguard 7, Colonel Young not wanting him stuck behind a desk. He now commands three Vanguard teams, the Knights, the Militia, and training of them all. What baffled her and everyone else in her company was that he did not get a promotion to Lieutenant Colonel. Most of the Vanguard logistical officers were around her station when Sharp faced off against Talin. The debate about his abilities ended after that engagement. First time against Talin, maybe lucky, a second time, talent. Yep, Sharp said. It isn't official yet, but I will address it when the time comes. She takes a relieved breath as they all get up and head out. All marching out of the bar. Hello, all. Enjoy your training today? Rory crosses her arm and there is so much pride in her expression. Yeah. It was fun beating Alicia twenty times. She lost once, Sharp said. Rory turns bright red, then pushes against Sharp with one hand and holding down her skirt with another. N.A., N.A., Ta, N.A. We will have none of that. She then turns to Selena. Hey, mind taking daddy here and get something to eat? We're hungry. She could not believe what she just saw. Today have been, strange. She watches Selina pull her dad away and Sharp lets out a large yawn. Rory waves goodbye and sits down in the chair in front of her. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Enjoy your little girl's date? Rory asked. She thinks on that and lets out an exhausted sigh. It was fine. You should come next time. I might next time, Rory said. I need to hand out with my minions more. 
minions? She asked, not believing what she said. Rory nods her head happily. She then leans forward. Hey Sarah, while we are alone, can I ask you a question? Now that confused her. Rory usually does not ask questions or if she does, it is to sharp or lelay. Both are like glue, you find one you see the other. Yes? Everything okay? Everything is fine, Rory said. I am just a little confused about something with you people. That bothered her hearing that. She hopes nothing offended her. Okay, you can ask me anything, Rory. Rory takes a moment to collect her thoughts. Why didn't Jackson get a promotion with everyone else? Even the Major General getting one. Is it really because of what happened with Selena? She asked confused about the matter. She thinks about her response. So, you've been wondering about this too? I do not think so, Rory. While many were not happy hearing that, she is a kid after all, and we do not care about bloodlines and royalty. It was more of a security matter and politics. If she just said something no one would have cared. Okay. Rory said and thinks. So, what is the big deal? I kind of wish I'd been paying more attention to your rules and laws. She chuckles hearing that. Being an apostle nearing a thousand years old, laws must seem a silly thing to her. She has been relying on Sharp and Lele to explain important information then trying to learn it herself. So, what is going on? Am I missing something? Rory asked. She looks around and sees Sharp and Selina still talking to the bartender. She looks back at Rory. I think he had some enemies back on Earth. Enemies? With your own kind. Rory said and thinks about that. Wow, politics does suck everywhere. Yes, it does sweetie, she said. Most of his record is still classified and she only been able to peek at parts of it. Most of the information she knows is what he told her. So far, she has not seen anything that would rub anyone in his odd command the wrong way. The only thing she can think of is Mexico, something he still has not gotten over. Because you already know and that I trust you, I will tell you my theory. I think it has to do with what happened in Mexico. Really? Just that? Rory said. One mission? I understand why he is upset about that but why your superiors would? It is war, people die. Do you people really punish people after one failure? Of course not, she said. Failure is seen as a learning experience. As you said, people die in war. They would not have done all of that to him for just one bad mission, which more I look into it, I don't think it is his fault. From my limited research on that mission, I don't see how anyone could blame him and his old team. She thinks about that and agrees with what Rory said. But two men died like cattle and an innocent family was murdered under his watch. That might have been enough for some to question his leadership and want to push him to the side. Rory just looks at her. Do you honestly believe that? Not at all, she responds. If the army wanted him out that badly, he never would be in the position he is in now, regardless of the war. This seems more of a personal thing to her. She remembers that the president has taken an interest in him, trusting his senses on the ground. She gets an email from the White House once and a while for updates. She does not want to ask directly, not wanting to put that pressure on the solider. She is glad that the current president was once a soldier, she understands the reality on the ground. Rory, I honestly have no idea. My gut is telling me that there is someone he rubbed the wrong way at some point. He might not even remember, but people hold grudges. She speaks. So, what do we do? Rory asked. She looks at Rory, somewhat shocked that she is asking her. Rory rarely asked for her opinion on anything. She enjoys being the leader of what has been labelled the girls. For now, nothing. We just do our best to help him. We do our jobs and build our friendship. Watch each other backs. Rory said with a smile. She nods her head and warns her to drop the topic as Sharp and Selina walks up. Hello, you two, she said with a smile. Sharp sits down and Selina next to her. Hello, I hope we didn't scare them away. 
He then sits down this large beer next to Rory. Here you go, Rory. Rory's eyes widen as she sees her large beer. Her smile gets bigger and bigger until she grabs it and starts drinking it. Ha, not really. Honestly, you kind of saved me. And Rory, don't drink too fast. She said as she takes a deep breath. It is okay, he will carry me home, Rory said and starts drinking it. She looks down and sees what he got. A big giant burger. Really? Mission tomorrow, Sharp said as he starts to eat. Selena reaches over and steals some fries, but he lightly slaps her hand. You have your fish and chips. I know, but I want yours, Selena stated. Wait. We have a mission tomorrow? Rory asked as she leans in, grabbing her Philly cheese steak with blue meat and red cheese. Yes, supply mission to Camp Galileo, Sharp said in an excited tone. We leave tomorrow afternoon. She giggles hearing that. Sharp, such an all-American hero and is such a nerd inside. She loves it. Wait, we are doing a supply mission to a base. Rory asked, upset by the news. This is so beneath me. Sharp chuckles. I think it would be a good idea to do a mission where nothing should go wrong for once. Do you honestly believe that with your record? She spoke. What was your first mission to this world, a simple reckon mission and look at all the drama that came from that? Yeah, Rory said as she stands up and slams her hands on the table. She then blinks and thinks about what Sarah said. She then looks over to Sarah. Hey, you are talking about me, aren't you? She can't be talking about Lele. She never gives anyone a headache. Sharp said. And she can't be talking about me. I am too cute. Selena said as she eats. Rory stands there and glares at them all. She giggles from all that and looks to Sharp. She has a point. You can get anyone to do a supply mission. Or is it this one place that interests you? Both Rory and Selena look up. She can see this nerdish glow coming from him. I see, boys. They never grow up. She said as she rolls her eyes with a big smile. Nope, Selena said. But because it is not a combat mission, can I go? Yes, Sharp responds. I think it would be good for you to come on this mission. It will be a good learning experience. At least until the school gets going. He then shots a stare at her. She takes a deep breath from that. Yeah. I need to get going on that. Harder than I thought. Get Nariko to help. She could use income and something to do. Just don't tell her where the money is coming from. Sharp said. She was confused at first, but then connected the dots. She smiles hearing that he is willing to help with the costs of her pet project. We'll do major. There is a moment of silence between the four until Selena speaks up. Can I give her the box? You said to wait a bit and it has been a bit. What box? She asked. She looks to Sharp and sees him nod to Selena. She then looks to Selena and sees her set this small box covered in duct tape. What is this? Open it, Sharp said. She picks up the box and already knows it is from Sharp. No one would ever use duct tape to wrap something. She pulls out her combat knock and starts cutting through it until it opens. Inside it is this twin silver bar pin, the US Army Captain rank. She looks up shocked. You have earned it. Effective immediately. Sharp said. Congratulations Captain Rose, Selena said. Thank you, she said as she changes her pin. I had no idea. I didn't see the paperwork. I know how to do paperwork. I just hate doing it. Sharp said. Rory stands up again and holds out her captain pin. I have one to see. So, you can't boss me around. Just remember that. She smiles happily for the promotion. It is a massive validation for all her work. While yes, she is behind the lines and feels like she does not tribute as much as she could, this helps remove those thoughts. Thank you dash dot. She said before the entire building starts shaking. The table chairs all start bouncing and people start screaming. 
Sharp grabs Selena and then Rory and pushes them under the table. She gets under the table and makes sure they stay calm. She can see both Rory and Selena holding onto each other, both scared to death. She looks to the side and sees this lamp fall as more screams can be heard. Sharp ducks down, unable to get under the table because of not enough room. Stay down, it's an earthquake. Stay in cover.